A leaked memo shows the police force is alarmed at the number of officers leaving and not enough is being done to stop the exodus. But senior officers say the memo is out of date and the problem is fixed. An alarming decline in police numbers is a problem that has continually been denied by the force. However, an internal email written in August by Assistant Commissioner Ray Shuey reveals his concern and states the increasing number of members leaving their job for a variety of reasons is disturbing and does not appear to be diminishing. But now he insists the memo is outdated. It's uh, three months old. It was talking about an issue that was seen to be critical at that time when 103 people had left the organisation in July. The large exodus put down to retirements and the lure of the corporate world. So we have a very attractive retirement scheme. We have people that take on other jobs and uh, members of the Victoria Police Force are very attractive in outside organisations. The memo also said that if the trend in resignations continues, we will have difficulty in matching attrition. We've got a handle on attrition and it's just a matter of making sure that we get quality recruits. And the government is confident its promise of 800 extra police by 2003 is safe. We've got record numbers coming through the police academy at the moment. Uh, the parade grounds there are absolutely overflowing. The police association insists that retaining experienced officers is a serious problem. They're calling on the chief commissioner and the government to implement a rescue package that will entice members to stay with the force. Improvements to the salary structure and improvements to career path opportunities. Start talking to the government about making this, making policing in Victoria a job that people want to do. Kelly Curtin, 10 News. Prime Minister John Howard has finally begun trade talks in Brunei after being stranded in Darwin for eight hours because of our broken down fleet of VIP aircraft. The embarrassment has prompted a challenge to Australians to provide better facilities for our politicians. Delayed by nine hours, Prime Minister Howard finally arrives in Brunei on an RAAF troop carrier. He and Mrs Howard travel economy class from Darwin after their Boeing 707 VIP aircraft broke down. Even the replacement was delayed by mechanical problems. They hardly left time to sleep before catching up on missed meetings. Good, sorry for the delay. Oh, Other world leaders arrived in impressive jets like Air Force One. Our leaders fly 30-year-old planes that leave a trail of air and noise pollution. They're unreliable and banned from most airports. They'll be replaced with new jets leased from Qantas in two years, but at a high political price. It's a bit of an attitude uh, with Australians in terms of um, you know, what we do provide and, and how we like to see our, our uh, ministers and, and leaders uh, moving around the globe. The Prime Minister did not want to complain. I'm, I'm, I'm utterly disinterested in that being an issue for discussion. I've got far more important things on my plate for Australia than the travelling convenience I or my colleagues may have. Despite the travel trip-ups, Mr Howard's objectives from this APEC meeting are well on track. He's got the 21 world leaders to agree to discuss oil prices. He'll have a meeting with Indonesian President Wahid, and Australia's set for trade breakthroughs with Singapore. Also pushing the free trade message, US President Clinton on his farewell visit. This will be my last APEC summit. I just don't know who will be here next year. <laughs> In Brunei, Paul Smith, 10 News. Australian scientists have made a major breakthrough in blood testing for Parkinson's disease. It's hoped the new test will provide a cheaper and quicker way of determining if someone is developing the disease before they begin suffering symptoms like tremors. Trials are being conducted at the Prince of Wales Medical Research Institute. While current tests can cost up to $1,000, it's expected the new procedure will cost just $10. An insight now into the troubled Federation Square. Despite its budget blowout and construction delays, the government says it is a project worth waiting for. It's been a controversial project from the start, but if you believe the government, Federation Square will be the place to be seen. This will be the new leading place for Melbourne. It's not going to be the Flinders Street clocks anymore. It'll be meet at Federation Square. However, inspecting the site today, the Minister revealed the controversy continues. Costs have blown out by almost $130 million and it's six to eight months behind schedule. It was set to open next May in time for the centenary of Federation celebrations. Now it won't open till late in the year. There is a desire to 
fast track the process and if you fast track a very big large project you end up with uh, a lot of complexity that's what we've got one such complexity has been the controversial western shard it's still being redesigned with concept plans not due until christmas this is going to be here for hundreds of years and i'm more worried about the next 200 years than a month or two housing cinemas function centers restaurants bars commercial sites and more federation square covers 3.8 hectares and will link the city to the yarra one of the major engineering feats of the project was to reduce the number of rail lines beneath it from 53 to 12. Four and a half thousand steel coils have also been put in place to absorb vibrations coming from the trains. The public will be able to view the construction site on Sunday week. Mignon Henny, 10 News. Meanwhile, a spectacular procession through the city has helped celebrate our state's birthday. 150 years ago on this day, Victoria announced it was time to cut its colonial ties with New South Wales. Okay. Pomp and ceremony for Victoria's 150th birthday, commemorating the announcement of our official separation from New South Wales. On hand, the superintendent of the time, Charles Latrobe, and his family. What a prodigious fine day to become a colony. Welcome to the most beautiful city in the... Well, what the city then, was Hundreds of school children sharing the moment with their own special interpretations of a new Victorian flag. Reenacting our first steps towards statehood, the colourful procession continued across the Prince's Bridge, declared open on this day in 1850. <laughs> The Freemasons stepping out in all their finery for the first time in 150 years to celebrate their key role in Victoria's development. I wasn't here when it was open, so it was nice to experience what it was like. I didn't know even that Victoria was ever part of New South Wales until today. They were a very happy country. <laughs> and it did very good. A picnic next to Governor Latrobe's cottage capped off celebrations and true to the day back in 18. 50 free sticky buns for all. Stephanie Taylor, 10 News. Still on birthdays and Australia's oldest resident has marked another milestone of her amazing long life in the slow lane. Harriet the giant tortoise trundled out to her 170th birthday party at the Australia Zoo. She was born in the Galacobus Islands, kidnapped by Sir Charles Darwin at the age of five and brought to Queensland where she celebrated her last 158 birthdays. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Harriet. Happy birthday to you. Well, the living dinosaur probably wondered what all the fuss was about, but was happy to munch on her favourite treat of hibiscus leaves. And our very youthful weatherman, Mike Larkin, is next with the weather. Yes, thanks, Jen, and a very good evening. Well, when the sun shines, the city sparkles, and half of Melbourne seems to just want to spend the day outdoors. And that is the case with me as well. I've popped out to the yard. I've hijacked the barbecue from the girls. Yeah, thanks, girls. I better keep rolling out of these sausages before I get them burnt and get in trouble from the girls. Well, we got to a top of 26 degrees this afternoon. It's been a beautiful day, fine and sunny, and right now still reasonably warm at 23 degrees. And while most of Melbourne is still under blue skies, that isn't the case in the north and northeastern suburbs, where it's bucketing down at the moment in some areas. Thunderstorm cells have sort of built up this afternoon and they've just produced the precipitation. Those storm cells are moving away from the city. The Bureau, though, says some showers and perhaps some scattered thunderstorms tonight and tomorrow around the Melbourne area. I'll have those weather details in full a little later in the news. Thank you, Mike. Also coming up, a new theory on what caused the Austrian tunnel tragedy. A workers dangle helplessly after a scaffolding accident. <laughs> 